Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Tuesday morning Grand Rounds. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Barry Markowitz. Uh, Dr. Markowitz comes to us from Children's Hospital Los Angeles, where he's the Medical Director of Pediatric Intensive Care and also the Chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Markowitz earned his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and received a master's in public health at St. Louis University. He then did a pediatric internship and residency at Children's Memorial at Northwestern University Medical Center, and then an anesthesiology residency at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He then completed a fellowship in pediatric anesthesiology and critical care medicine at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, right now, he's at the University of Southern California's uh, Keck School of Medicine, where he's a full professor of clinical pediatrics and anesthesiology. He's board certified in pediatrics, pediatric or critical care medicine, as well as anesthesiology and pediatric anesthesiology. And he's been involved in numerous research studies uh, related to intensive care throughout his career. Uh, Dr. Markowitz is a member of the pediatric section of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the Pediatric uh, uh, Cardiac Intensive Society, and he served on the executive committee of the critical care section of the AAP. He serves on several editorial boards and was the chairman of the research committees of the VPS in an international pediatric ICU quality and research collaborative. He's also recently completed a term as chair of the scientific committee of the largest, largest pediatric critical care uh, research network in North America. He will be joined today by Ann Truden. Ann is the mother of four children and her third children, Jack, was born with a rare congenital muscular dystrophy that affected his muscles, eyes, and brain. He had a, a trach and required the support of a ventilator, was nonverbal and nonmobile and required around the clock care. He died eight years ago at the age of 15 from complications of his disease. Anne has experienced hundreds of encounters with doctors and other medical professionals, including some here at Phoenix Children's, uh, beginning with Jack's premature birth and compli first, complicated first year of life where he spent many months in the pediatric intensive care unit. Uh, throughout his uh, diagnostic odyssey, many procedures and surgeries and hospitalizations he's endured, as well as a transition to palliative care and finally to hospice at the end of his life. Anne uh, also has a, a bachelor's of science in law degree uh, from the University of Arizona. She works as an estate planning and probate attorney, is founder of the Willow Tree Foundation, an Arizona nonprofit that funds respite for parents and medically fragile children. And she's a co-editor with Dr. Markowitz of Shared Struggles, Stories from Parents and Pediatricians Caring for Children with Serious Illnesses. So their talk today is entitled Shared, uh, Shared Struggles, Stories from Parents and Pediatricians Caring for Children with Serious Illnesses, the Grand Rounds Editions. So Dr. Markowitz and Anne, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I think this is especially um, um, uh, unique for uh, Anne, given her uh, time uh, spending with all of you. Um, so uh, Anne will tell you about this book, but uh, when we were invited to give Grand Rounds, Anne said, I've never given, I've never been in Grand Rounds. I don't even know what it is. So I, I said, I've been to a few, um, but I promise that I don't know that you'll ever be at a Grand Rounds like this again, or you've been to one before. Uh, we're going to violate a lot of rules. Um, we're going to read stories. Um, and uh, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, why Grand Rounds? Why this book? Um, we were interviewed for a podcast by the founder of the Courageous Parents Network. And at one point in there, I said, you can't teach these lessons in a lecture. So we're not going to lecture to you. We're not going to teach, you know, try to do that today. But um, hopefully um, just by reading a, uh, a few stories and sharing um, uh, insights from the parents and pediatricians of these children, uh, this will be um, a meaningful um, uh, story for you. So um, we have no um, uh, relevant disclosures. Uh, this is a book. It is for sale. Uh, we don't uh, make any proceeds from this. Everything gets donated to nonprofits. Um, so the objectives today uh, to learn the value of shared stories in medical education, seeing children through their parents' eyes, uh, can't emphasize this enough. And that uh, re recognizing the courage and power that humility brings to your care, particularly with children with complex conditions. So this is an overview of our talk, how this book came to be, why we think this book is needed or uh, hearing these stories is needed. We'll read uh, two stories, one from a parent, one from a pediatrician. 
uh, and uh, and we'll share some lessons that we think can be learned from the stories and from this book, and then we'll see we'll see where this goes. So, um, Anne. Morning. Um, so, how Share Struggles came to be is as part of how the book came to be. I'll share a little bit about how Barry and I know each other. Um, I met Barry in the winter of 1999 when he was one of the intensivists who was caring for my then two month old son, Jack, who had been admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit at St. Louis Children's Hospital. Uh, after a complicated course, um, Jack was discharged from the PICU after six months with a trachea G tube and connected to a ventilator. Uh, Barry took on the unconventional role of managing Jack's vent after discharge, because at the time, the hope was that the vent would only be a temporary intervention because Jack didn't yet have a diagnosis. And then in 2002, our family moved from St. Louis to Phoenix. Yet despite the break in the doctor-patient relationship, Barry and I kept in touch over the course of Jack's life. I often sought out Barry's advice and reason when it came to Jack's care, and Barry always listened and helped in any way that he could. Um, Jack was eventually diagnosed with a rare congenital muscular dystrophy called dystroglycanopathy CMD, and it affected his muscles, his eyes, and his brain. Uh, Jack lived a love-filled life for 15 years, and eight years ago, on January 5th, 2014, Jack died from complications of his disease. Uh, the, the idea for the book was envisioned shortly after Jack died, and while Barry and I will never agree on whose idea the book was, because if you ask me, I'll tell you it was his idea, but if you ask him, he'll insist it was mine. Uh, regardless of whose idea the book was, um, we both recognized that the connection we had and what we'd learned from each other needed to be shared, and the conversation needed to be expanded to include other parents and other physicians. We envisioned a both sides of the story in the care of medically complex children kind of book. We knew there were books written by doctors, books written by parents, but this would be the first book we knew of that would bring the stories of parents and doctors together. So we reached out to our respective networks of parents and colleagues for stories, not knowing what to expect, but hoping for the best. And the response we received was overwhelmingly kind and supportive. And as a result, shared struggles came to be. And I'll also share that two contributors to, uh, to the book were Dr. Wendy Bernatovich and Dr. Tressia Shaw from Phoenix Children's. And Dr. Wendy and Dr. Shaw were Jack's um, palliative care and hospice doctors. So there's Phoenix Children's connection there. Um, shared struggles is a compilation of 46 stories and they're grouped under the predominant themes that emerge from the stories, which are compassion, trust, communication, and hope. And then following each story is a parent commentary that I wrote and a physician commentary that Barry wrote, and the commentaries are intended to provide an independent perspective on the events and messages conveyed by the story contributor. Uh, Shared Struggles was written over the course of six years, but I like to say its roots were planted over 20 years ago in a pediatric intensive care unit when a little boy named Jack and his mom met a truly special doctor. So why is this book needed? Well, there are approximately 3 million children in the United States living with chronic complex conditions. In emergency rooms, ICUs, hospital rooms, and clinics, the parents of these children spend a significant amount of time around the healthcare team. And we can interact with as many as 10 or more pediatric subspecialists. These interactions can often be filled with tension and misunderstanding. Parents can make assumptions about physicians, such as he doesn't care, or she thinks I'm being difficult. And physicians can make assumptions about parents, such as they don't understand their child's disease, or she's just an angry mom. But on the other hand, there are also many instances of compassion and understanding and encounters where parents and physicians are deeply affected and changed by their interactions and relationships. So by giving a voice to both parents and physicians and by listening and learning from their stories, we hope this book will lead to improved communication and foster trust and compassion among physicians, patients, and families. 
Um, from my point of view, it takes too long for these messages to get into the hearts and brains of pediatricians and kind of view this book as a primer. Um, this is not taught in medical school um, or even probably residency or other training. It just comes over time. And so that we hope that this book uh, and these messages kind of kickstart that learning and jolt pediatricians uh, awake into how they think about these uh, situations. Uh, we're increasingly learning the value of narrative-based medicine, where if a picture paints a thousand words, a thousand words can tell a, a profoundly impactful story. Uh, and reading an actual story about an individual child and family um, can tug at your heartstrings the way reading about a randomized controlled trial never will. Uh, it's why newspapers, when they cover stories, of exe for example, about refugees, they dive into the details about one particular family or one particular child. So it makes it very different. Even listening to Ann just now saying that there's 3 million children that have uh, complex medical conditions, that doesn't resonate the way it does when you hear about a particular story. So um, hopefully um, those will be uh, the, the framework by which we um, uh, share these stories. So we will um, read a story by uh, a mom uh, and we'll read a story by a physician in the book, um, we identify the authors, but we don't identify a story with an author in the book itself, just out of concerns about uh, anonymity. But these um, authors agreed to have their names attached to these stories that we are reading to you today. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing because now we go into story time. And you want to start? Okay, the parent story I'm gonna read is Respect a Two-Way Street. My husband and I knew our son would have a serious disability when he was born. In the 16th week of my pregnancy, we received the diagnosis of spina bifida. When Miles was born, things were worse than we had imagined. He spent his first five months in the ICU hooked up to machines. He had eight brain surgeries, including a high risk Chiari 2 decompression surgery when he was 12 weeks old. What stands out the most from that time was the coding. I watched Miles code and be brought back to life countless times during those first months of his life. We adjusted to a very new normal when we brought Miles home. I remember feeling utterly grateful and completely terrified at the same time. The chaos did not slow down because Miles continued to code and code constantly. His brain abnormality would cause his brain stem to essentially turn off. A few days before his first birthday, we took Miles to see the pulmonologist. While they were weighing him, he coded. We were admitted straight to the PICU. After an extensive brain MRI, I got a visit from the neurosurgical resident. He began with, your son needs something called a Chiari 2 decompression, and then went on to explain the surgery in overly simplified detail, not knowing or asking what my level of understanding was in regards to Miles' condition or the surgery he needed. He finished with, we can do the surgery tomorrow morning. I told him, as I'm sure you know, Miles has already had that surgery and it didn't benefit him. It was also very painful and a difficult recovery. So I'm not sure that I wanna move forward. I need to talk to my husband and think about this. He did not like that I was not immediately aligning with his plan of care and proceeded to explain the surgery to me while raising his voice. Your son's brain is like a car crushed up against a wall. You should want that car to move away from that wall. If this were my child, I would be getting the surgery. I would not even question it. You don't seem to understand the severity of this and I'm trying to explain it to you. I do understand, trust me. If you only knew what this last year has been like. The doctor left the room at the same time my mentor from church entered with lunch. Before I had a chance to eat, the chief of neurosurgery walked into the room. I knew him well, and he had a much gentler approach when discussing options. He told me that decompression surgery was an option, but not a very good one, because studies show the second decompressions were not, are not extremely successful. There was no great explanation as to why Miles was coding all the time. Maybe he would outgrow it over time, maybe not. This doctor agreed with my choice to think about it as long as I needed to, though he added, if you go home to think, we should send Miles home on comfort care. One of these days, you may not be able to bring him back. We have a team, help, we can have a team help you through that. 
My son was on hospice for an entire year as I continued to bring him back to life constantly. Because he kept living, he graduated to palliative care when he was two years old. He is now five years old and starting kindergarten. His baseline status is still extreme, but Miles is with us. He is loved, he is happy, and that is fundamentally all a parent can ask for. When I look back on the week Miles was placed on hospice, I wish that I only remembered the compassionate chief of neurosurgery that gently laid out the options, gave me credit for my knowledge, and included me in the plans. Yet as humans often do, I remember the resident that made me feel belittled and angry. He seemed to see my son as an interesting case instead of a human being. He was not seeing the entire picture, that there was a life behind the surgery he was proposing, a life that could be lost or suffer more damage, and parents who were suffering greatly. Respectful communication is really valued by parents of medically complex kids. Invite me into the dialogue and ask my opinion, or at the very least, respect my concerns. In our world, we have been forced to become experts in a field we did not choose. I dare say that I have performed CPR more times than most doctors. I don't need a trophy for that, but it would be nice to hear every once in a while, good job, mom. I can see how a neurosurgical resident wants to feel respect for their years of grueling work to get where they are, but so do I. And then the parent commentary that I wrote for this story. We know physicians have years of formal education under their belt, have endured long hours during their residency and fellowship, have encountered challenging and difficult patients and families, and have had many patient experiences we know nothing about. We understand that you have worked long and hard to acquire the knowledge that you bring to us when talking to us about our child's condition or treatment plan. We respect that, or at least we should. What we bring to you when talking to you about our child is the knowledge that comes from more sleepless nights than we can count, watching every rise and fall of our child's chest, managing a ventilator, clearing our child's airway for hours on end, begging our child back to life, administering around the clock medications. We have exhaustively researched our child's disease or condition, found the experts, sent emails, made phone calls, and we have experienced a level of heartache, trauma, hope, and love that only a parent can feel for their own child. When you find yourself in a discussion with a parent who is impatient, frustrated, angry, or disagreeable, please pause and consider or imagine all that we have been through with our child up to that point. If we do not agree with you, it's not personal. It is because we know that ultimately, we are the ones who have to live with the consequences and emotional toll of every decision made for our child. So my uh, commentary was, uh, it is said that the most compassionate members of the medical profession are medical students. Eager and bright eyed, they come into the field full of empathy and a zeal to help people. Sadly, it seems after years of grueling training, though the rules are lightening the slog, many young physicians have had their hearts hardened at least a bit. Young physicians are also the least confident and as defense mechanisms can, uh, mechanism can present themselves as the precise opposite, overconfident. When it comes to listening to the wisdom of parents of medically complex children, I feel that my generation of physicians has not done enough to transfer this simple li line of advice. Trust the parents as the experts with their children. However, parents must also recognize that in nearly every situation where a resident or fellow presents a plan to, uh, to the family, particularly surgical plans, he or she has not come up with the idea on their own. Uh, trainees are often tasked to obtain parental consent for procedures that have been deemed proper by attending physicians. Again, this too is another area where my generation may have let our trainees down by not modeling this behavior well enough. Consent is a process, not an event. It should not be a task to check off a list, certainly not when it comes to children with complex needs. Trust must be established so the family knows the physician understands the child and the parents understand the physician. What is the shared mental model of, of the problem? What are the options? What are the risks and benefits of the options? What is the parent's understanding of the situation and choices? How, and how does their experience with their child help inform the physician and therefore the mutual decision to be made? So I will read a story by a physician um, uh, called A Voice That Doesn't Use Words. Uh, I will 
tell you that uh, I've read this story many times and it's still uh, kind of break, cracks me up. So I, in an emotional way, not a funny way. So, so I, I apologize if that comes to, comes out again. It's it's uh, it's hard. Frequent flyer, the pediatric intensive care unit fellow said with a sigh, giving me a heads up on the patient who would soon be arriving from the ED. I was moonlighting weekends in the PICU for some extra cash, having just started my pediatric palliative care fellowship. I had admitted dozens, if not hundreds, of so-called frequent flyers in my training and early career and felt like I had the routine down. These kids typically had some variety of complex chronic illness. This particular young woman was no exception, maybe early teens with a rare metabolic syndrome that I thought I remember reading about once, but really knew nothing about. She arrived in the PICU on the transport bed, curled up on her side, blankets tangled around her feet. She didn't appear to be responding uh, to or even aware of her surroundings. As they rolled into the PICU, her mother kept pace, kept pace at the side of the bed, halfway bent over the rail, speaking quietly with her daughter and massaging one contorted soldier, a, a shoulder. The, the patient who I learned from a glance from the ED papers was named Cassie, was transferred to a PICU bed. I took a brief history from her mom, having more or less already decided on the best path, best path forward. Having moved to a cursory physical exam, I was just finishing up auscultating her back when her mom, now facing both me and Cassie on the opposite side of the bed, looked at me and said, Cassie's actually a bit hungry now. What, I asked, pulling the stethoscope from my ears. She's hungry. Her feeds were held down at ED. She didn't really care about down there, but now she wants them. I stood, looping the stethoscope over my neck like a prize, prize fighter's belt. Well, I explained, I would like to continue holding off on feeds for now, at least until we have a better idea what's going on. Not a good idea, she said, shaking her head. She just told me she's hungry, which she never does unless she's feeling okay. Sorry, I said, I must not have heard her. I moved around to the foot of the bed to get a better look at Cassie, but as far as I could see, her face was still frozen in the same inscrutable rictus as when she arrived. Well, she didn't say it out loud, she explained, sounding a bit annoyed. She rarely actually says any words, but she communi communicates with me mostly through her face and eyes. And she just gave me this sort of lip and tongue movement plus blinking that she uses to tell me she's hungry. I could not decide which was more likely, that Cassie, Cassie ever vocalized any words or that she had just actually blinked, let alone done so in a meaningful way to signal hunger. Well, I said, playing for time, let me go run things by the fellow in attending, both of whom may be more familiar than I am with Cassie, and I'll circle back with a plan. The day finished uneventfully, both for me and for Cassie. Cassie indeed got her feeds after some pushing on her mom's part and settled into her quote-unquote routine admission. I headed off at the end of my shift. Over the next few months, I saw her again a few times during subsequent admissions that happened to overlap, uh, overlap with my moonlighting shifts. Cassie's mom was, to her credit, clearly devoted to her care, always at the bedside, always attentive to her needs. As I progressed through my pediatric uh, palliative care fellowship, I learned a great deal about communication, about listening, about paying attention to parents and children and keeping the values at the center of the story. But I do not think I, I ever really connected those lessons with my experience caring for Cassie. That was until I was told that I would be joining two other palliative care providers for a home visit to see Cassie and her mom. Home visits were not very much a part of why I went into medicine. And knowing that uh, what I did about Cassie's barely responsive state, it was some with some reluctance that I joined my palliative care colleagues for the visit. I grudgingly headed out one cold winter morning for the hour-long drive to her home, mostly expecting just a wasted uh, morning. Their modest home was tucked away in a rural wooded area down a dirt road. We were warmly welcomed by Cassie's mom, who radiated energy, radiated energy in a way that I'd never seen in the hospital. Cassie's room was on the ground floor, and at first glance, just felt like a regular, albeit somewhat crowded, child's bedroom. At the center of it all, lying in a bed, in the bed, underneath full sheets, was Cassie herself. Much as in the hospital, she appeared to be lying curled up on one side, her gaze fixed out the window. I moved around to where I could see her face and was struck at once by how peaceful she looked, not at all, um, not at all like she usually did during hospital admissions. I gave her a cheery hello, of course, feeling it was more for the benefit of her mom and her nurse than out of any expectation that she would register my presence, let alone knew who I was. Then in a moment that seemed almost staged, she shifted her eyes, looked up at me, and smiled. I do not want to overstate this. She did not sit up. She did not start chatting with me. She did, did not reach for my hand. But for all the times I had seen Cassie in the hospital, this was the first time I had seen a flicker of the person that her mother saw. The first time it dawned on me that Cassie really did communicate, 
with her, with her mother, and although she may not have communicated in the way that the rest of the medical team would normally be alert to, it was nonetheless real and pur purposeful. Sadly, I realized that I had not been open to the possibility, had not been attuned to the fact that Cassie might have been, indeed been telling her mom things like, I'm hungry. I had made assumptions about Cassie and her mom. I do not believe that I ever treated her as less than a person, but I do believe that I had not left space for her voice, regardless of what voice actually meant. That moment of contact of connection and real communication with this person remains a pivotal moment in my career. I always take uh, uh, care now to allow space for children to express their voice in whatever form that might take. To not expect that communication occur in my terms, but rather to be open to whatever terms and means of communication, no ma matter how subtle a child might choose. The parent commentary that I wrote for this story. This story is one that every parent of a severely disabled nonverbal child wishes every doctor who cared for their child could read and learn from. I have great respect for this physician's honesty and humility. His initial feelings regarding Cassie's ability to communicate and her mother's ability to interpret what she was communicating are reactions that parents of nonverbal children experience time and time again. A parent's first experience learning to communicate with their child is when they bring their newborn baby home from the hospital. All newborn babies, healthy or otherwise, communicate without words. As a parent bonds with their baby, we instinctively know what our baby's cry is communicating. We learn to distinguish between a hunger cry, a tired cry, and a not feeling well cry. This parental instinct that allows us to understand our newborn baby only deepens and becomes more highly attuned over the years as we intimately care for our disabled child in every aspect of their lives. No one questions that a newborn baby can communicate through their cries, smiles, and big bright eyes. The same holds true for our disabled child. We have learned to interpret their, our nonverbal child's gaze, gestures, and nuances. Trust that we know our child and listen to us. We are their voice. My son has a t-shirt with these words printed on it that sum up the important takeaway from the story. Just because I can't talk doesn't mean I have nothing to say. Every physician who cares for children with severe conditions that impair their ability to communicate should not just read this story, they should memorize it. As physicians have learned to recite the muscles in the arm or the chambers in the heart, they should be able to tell this story over and over again. I have learned over the years that parents can read their nonverbal children with a skill set no physician possesses. I try to imagine a simply different language that is being spoken between child and parent one that I never learned and never will. Just as we learn to trust our hospital's interpreters to communicate with families who do not speak English, we must treat the parents as interpreters for these children. But these interpreters did not take a course to learn the language. They have lived it and learned it over time, often over years. Just as I would never second guess where a cardiac surgeon decides to where to cut or how to stitch, who am I to question the person with the most expertise in the world at communication with a nonverbal child? Um, so um, these are the um, themes will uh, alternate um, that the themes that came out in the stories will alternate our um, you know essentially a commentary about these about these themes so a, th a sub theme that is talked about in many of the stories throughout the book is quality of life and as you can imagine, quality of life is a sensitive subject for parents of severely disabled children. It stings when we hear that doctors think our child has a low quality of life. But if I'm honest, I can understand why doctors might feel this way. Because if you had asked me in the winter of 1999, I would not have said that a child who would never walk, talk, eat by mouth, or breathe without the assistance of a machine could have a good quality of life. But then we brought Jack home. And during the 15 years he was with us, he taught me what a good life really means. I've learned that assumptions about quality of life should not be based on what you see and experience in a hospital setting. That's only a snapshot in time. And without question, being in the hospital is not a good quality of life for the child or the family. It is the relationship that we have with our child 
that gives our child's life value, not what our child can or cannot do. And in the end, quality of life can truly only be determined by us because we experience the whole picture of our child's life. So allow each family to define for themselves and their child what quality of life means. So from my perspective, um, a simple uh, mantra that your values are not their values. Um, we all come with implicit uh, biases. Uh, we're learning this greatly uh, in today's age. And this it, it, it uh, revolves around this principle too. It's not for the physician to judge quote unquote quality of life because doing so imposes our value structure on the family in front of us. And as a corollary, um, uh, hopefully some of you cringed when you heard that neurosurgical resident say, if this were my child, I would suggest that we never say, if this were my child to a family, because unless you have literally walked in their shoes, uh, you have no idea what you would do if you were the parent of that, with the child in front of you. You can and should offer your best medical recommendations for each child, taking into account their uh, family's values, hopes, and expectations, and your medical knowledge. As one physician author beautifully states, quality of life has nothing to do with value of life. There is immeasurable value to every human life. Communication, communication with parents, I don't think it can be overstated that parents know their child best. And we, we know our, doc, our child's doctor only wants what's best for our child. And we know we really are on the same team. But what we know intellectually and what we feel may not always align if we don't feel we're being listened to. So communicate with us often and include us in discussions and decisions regarding our child's care plan. When a parent feels that the doctor caring for their child trusts the parent's expertise when it comes to their own child, it's much easier for the parent to trust the doctor. And through good communication and mutual respect, Together we can achieve what is best for our child. And as the story Barry read so beautifully shows us, when it comes to communication with our children, you know, understand that nonverbal children can communicate through their eyes, their facial expressions, and their body language. And trust that we know our child and can interpret their nonverbal communication. And also a, a gentle reminder that even though our child can't talk, they can hear. So please acknowledge our child when you walk into the room. It is possible to make a connection with our child if you take some time and pay attention to them as you would with a typical child you care for. Yeah, I, I hope um, you all have uh, recognized why this reading that story was hard for me. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have been in that same situation and not recognized um, that there is a, there's a, a child in there that can communicate. Um, so I have a very simple lesson, um, this adage that I've heard many times, you have two ears and one mouth and you should use them in that proportion. And again, it can't be uh, said uh, enough that you have to trust the parents as their interpreters for their children. So hope, um, give our child the chance to write their own story and be open to the possibility that things could turn out better than you expect. Approach each child as a unique individual and look at the child, not the disease or condition for guidance. Also understand that our hopes for our child are not fixed in time. Hope evolves and changes over time as our child's condition changes and we come to have a better understanding and acceptance of our child's disease or condition and its impact on their life. A parent who has hope is not a parent who refuses to accept the reality of their child's disease and prognosis. Hope is how we survive. It is what gives us the strength to get up each day, put one foot in front of the other, and be the best caregiver, advocate, and voice for a child that we can be. Be mindful to never extinguish hope because there's a worse thing than false hope. It is no hope. I'm gonna read a short excerpt from a parent story called Every Single Second Worth It. There are no backdoor escapes from suffering in this life, though we all seek exactly these outs. I don't know what it's like to watch countless children and their families suffer, only my own. But I do know what it's like to have a counterbalance to that suffering, something that I can only guess is woefully inaccessible in an ICU. 
The time in between crises, the kind of joy that comes from enduring the suffering, the depth of friendship with fellow caretakers, and the love that finds in brokenness an unspeakable preciousness. Speak, yes, with honesty, but always with encouragement and love. If there's an obstacle that brings you to your limits, fight. Fight for hope, whatever that hope looks like. This is a tough line to walk as physicians uh, trained to present our beliefs as truths. But short of diagnosing brain death, respect that our prognoses are rarely 100% certain. They are more like educated guesses. So please allow some room for hope. I'm going to read a quick excerpt from a physician story. In the months that since Nathan left my hospital, he has sustained several further setbacks. I spoke to his father recently by phone. He sounded tired and sad as he talked about their struggles to come to terms with Nathan's decline. I told him how sorry I was and that I wish things could be different. It is a strange mind spe space to know what is likely to happen and simultaneously wholeheartedly hope and strive for something different. Parents with, of children with life-limiting medical conditions are forced to inhabit this space. They knew too well the oscillations between optimism and despair, visualizing the dream and being co confronted by the reality. Being a physician for these children and their parents requires sensitivity to that experience and I believe a willingness to genuinely align oneself with the parent's hope. Only by doing so does one earn the right to speak the painful truth, to gently help prepare them for the loss to come. It is, I am discovering, the greatest art of palliative care or of good medicine in general. Parents as advocates. Admittedly, parents of medically complex children can be high maintenance. We've acquired a great amount of knowledge throughout the years of caring for a child, and we ask a lot of questions, we have a lot of opinions, and we're often impatient. We spend a great amount of energy trying to keep our child out of the hospital and bring our child to the hospital only when we've thought of every possible explanation and used everything in our home medical arsenal to help our child feel better and have been unsuccessful. Our ability to manage our child's complex care at home gives us a sense of control over an otherwise unimaginable way of life. So when our child ends up in the hospital, much of our frustration stems from loss of control. Communication is key. A parent advocating for their child is not an angry parent. It is a parent doing what they need to do to make sure their child gets the best care possible based on what is important and valued by the parent in the care of their child. So as I've said, uh, we need to trust the parents as the real experts and, um, and, their, and their wisdom and their communication should be as valued partners. And that this focus on humility is, I think, ex um, illustrated by this uh, passage. Um, it is difficult to articulate all the lessons I learned from caring um, for Nathan and his parents. But one the main one is this, Physicians are taught to practice evidence-based medicine and work only within the realm of expertise. When no practice guidelines exist and the only evidence is tangentially related at best, I learned that there is value in being willing to step outside of my professional comfort zone to partner with the family. Nathan's parents had already risked everything, their jobs, their finances, personal health, and other relationships to help their son have the best life he could. Could I not risk a little too? Could I, could I not embrace a little inconvenience? And swallow a little pride to reach out to physicians in distant hospitals and read testimonials by other parents in order to find and critically evaluate every last possible option to improve Nathan's care. That was what his parents asked for. And to their credit, it was really exactly what the kind of care Nathan deserved. Humility is a rare but vital characteristic for physicians caring for such children. Humility says, I don't have the answer, let's find it together. Humility in a physician is decidedly not a sign of weakness but rather the bravest sign of strength. An emotion that courses through many of the parent stories and certainly one that resonates with me is gratitude. Caring for a medically complex child is very much a team effort and our children introduce us to the most remarkable people who become part of our team. We spend a, a lot of time with our child's doctors and can't help but feel a deep connection to the people who work with us to give our child the best life possible. There's nothing more comforting than seeing the familiar face of your favorite doctor, the one who knows you and your child and who greets you with a hug and a smile. There's an incredible sense of relief knowing that the degree of advocating that will be required of you will be greatly reduced 
because the doctor will be your frontline advocate and she will let the team know you're an experienced parent who should be listened to. And when we reach the point in our child's life when there's nothing more that can, can be done medically for our child, we, all, we will always hold close to our heart those doctors and others on our child's healthcare team who find a way to let us know that you care and that our child's life mattered. And this is from a parent's story, what matters at the end. The same holds true for Joey's pulmonologist. His humility, compassion, and ability to embrace our pain as well as his own helplessness opened our eyes to the importance of connection. By this point, we had long ruled out a miracle and any potential solution to the unfixable problem that a fatal diagnosis is. Instead, connection and the presence of others became the most vital and valuable gifts to us. Connection takes us deeper than job descriptions and formalities, but it needs to take its own shape and can never be forced or fabricated. It cannot be achieved through a formula or a prescribed set of best practices. It can be as simple and as profound as a pediatric pulmonologist in civilian clothing, sitting on a couch with his dying patient gently cradled in his arms. So you've heard this phrase before, parents do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. I would take that to heart. Uh, even when knowledge runs out, care should not ever. Even if you don't believe what the parents believe, believe in the parents. Um, from a physician story, from a parent story, what, what has always stood out about Dr. B is his humanness. Is he the most knowledgeable pulmonary doctor on staff? Probably not. The most experienced, not even close. Neither is he some idyllic Patch Adams, but he connects with his patients and their families. When Addison was first discharged from Children's as a baby, we were assigned the least experienced pulmonologist in the group, Addison's parents and her doctor. We were all rookies of caring for a medically fragile and complex child. We listened to each other, we learned together, and we came to trust each other. Dr. B understands and acknowledges that our lived experience in managing Addison's medical needs over the years carries equal weight to what was learned in medical school. Dr. B's willingness to be vulnerable, to admit he's wrong, and taking the time to know us, not just as parents of a patient, but as people with common interests, displays a rare humanity that is often missing in the doctor-patient relationship. This humanity stands out. This humanity is instrumental in creating a trusting relationship and a trusting relationship with your child's doctor is imperative when you have a child with chronic complex conditions or require a lifetime of care. And the last theme uh, will come as no surprises to, surprise to you, doctors are people too. So many of the stories in the book eloquently and powerfully share the human side of doctors who care for our children. And although it's a side of doctors that patients and parents don't often see, when doctors share their human side, it helps us know that you care about our child and you care about us. Because our child's the one suffering, because we suffer when our child suffers, we often only see compassion through the narrow confines of our individual world of suffering and how it impacts us. And we don't think about how caring for our children impacts doctors. What these stories show us is that doctors become attached to their patients and families. Doctors are generally happy when things go well for our child and doctors grieve and hurt when their patients suffer and die. So even if they don't expect it from us, doctors are equally deserving of the same compassion and grace that we expect from them. And this is, a, this is from a physician story, minute by minute, step by step. As I reflect on my experience, I regret one moment. After a debrief, my co-fellow offered to hold my pager for 15 minutes so I could have a short reprieve from being called to help another patient. I said no. Would have providing an ounce of compassion for myself have been seen, have, have been a sign of weakness? Was continuing on as if nothing happened a sign of strength? Compassion exuded from my soul for this family, almost to the point where I could no longer continue on. But for myself, it was held captive, deep in the pit of my stomach. I needed a moment to remind myself, I am human too. It was not something I wanted to admit. For the future, it is something I will embrace. So I will um, just read this brief uh, uh, sort of end note to the book that, that I wrote. Um, and once again, we learn the impact of these complicated children and their loving parents on a physician and how these interactions can open one's eyes, ears, minds, and hearts in truly meaningful ways. 
Ultimately, despite all our scientific advancements, learning medicine remains an apprenticeship. We certainly do not learn how to manage complex patients like these in medical school and are barely able to absorb lessons as deep as these during training. It can take years of practice and listening and final learning to become the type of physician that is highlighted in this book as a true and trusted partner. I do not think it unintentional when we say we are quote unquote practicing medicine. Few of us ever really get it right and need to keep practicing day in day out. When we have parent partners as highlighted in this book, practice can make perfect for these most complicated and vulnerable children. So um, I'd like to just highlight uh, when, when you're asked to describe what's the characteristics of a great doctor, a great healthcare provider, great person, you'll talk about you know, technical skill or medical knowledge or diagnostic expertise, but then the list uh, starts to uh, evolve into quote unquote soft skills, emotional intelligence, compassion, um, uh, empathy, uh, ability to communicate, ability to listen, those skills are what really matter. No parent in this entire book ever said the, the bronchoscopy that that pulmonologist did, it was unbelievably precise. Or that surgeon, boy, every stitch she put in was perfect. They talk about empathy. They talk about communication. They talk about being authentic. And that's what makes a great doctor. And that's what, they, they, that's what these stories um, represent. So, um, uh, Again, I think the, the message here for physicians in particular is to look at, try to look at the children through their parents' eyes. Um, here you see, it looks like a happy, loving family and a little boy in the middle acting silly until you notice his tracheostomy. This is Miles. This is the boy that, in the story that Anne read. Um, so I, I hope that um, the messages we presented uh, are meaningful, they're eye-opening, hopefully tug at a few heartstrings since ultimately it's our hearts that drive us uh, day to day and I, uh, we would, uh, we appreciate your time and the invitation and happy to answer uh, questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Markowitz and Anne for uh, fascinating grand rounds. Uh, certainly from time to time, uh, you know, amongst all the other subjects that we need to stay up to date on, uh, I think everybody would agree we all need to you know, tune up the emotional part of ourselves and, and the way we deliver care in addition to the type of care that we deliver. Uh, so thank you very much for your very pertinent examples and being willing to share with us on this topic uh, that's always very challenging. Uh, we've invited a couple uh, guests from uh, Anne's past, uh, two of the doctors that took care of her son, Jack, uh, during the last part of his life, uh, Tracy Shaw and uh, Wendy Bernatovich, I'd like to have both of you. You can uh, turn on your videos and we'll let you submit the first questions. Uh, and everybody else, uh, we've got the Q&A open as well as the chat. So uh, anybody who uh, wants to put in a question on the Q&A or the chat, we will uh, review them. And if anybody uh, wants to join uh, uh, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Bernatovich, and uh, uh, being promoted to panelist, uh, just uh, send something and we will let you uh, unmute yourself and uh, turn on your video and interact with our uh, uh, speaker. Jesse, why don't you go ahead? Can you hear? Can yes. anyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, sorry. Um, I um, just wanted to thank both of you again for um, writing this book and, and editing and doing all the things. This is such a, an important topic um, and we appreciate you being here today um, to do this grand rounds. Um, I am imagining that we have a lot of trainees that are on the grand rounds today. Um, and I'm wondering um, what, um, if there is, there's lots of really poignant messages for, for everyone to take away, but um, just anything, <laughs> other things that you're really hoping our trainees will take away from this. Um, and as we wait for questions, hopefully to come in on the Q&A here, there was a question about where to buy the book too, as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what we want them to take away. Well, we kind of went through the themes, but I mean, if you just, if you're gonna reiterate the important points is, I mean, we know we're on the same team. Mm -hmm. Communication 
is vital to make sure that what we know and what we feel align. Um, parents know their children best. Um, I think someone asked me at a prior meeting presentation, you know, what do you want us to know? We don't want to be in the hospital. So, you know, that's kind of why we're impatient and, and we um, probably not the easiest to live with. But um, again, I think if communication is key. I think one thing that uh, we talked about is that, you know, because we have knowledge, sometimes there's this assumption that we don't really need to be talked to because we already know, but it's quite the opposite. We need to be informed a lot. And just because it's that sense of control. So while we don't have a whole lot of control, if we can at least be informed a lot, even if it's just short little, hey, this is what's going on. It, it makes all the difference in, in um, helping us stay pleasant while we're in the hospital with our child. Yeah, I'm wondering that the story about the home visit um, is just so powerful to me. I, I have the, the joy of going to do home visits in Dr. Wendy as well in our work in both hospice and palliative care. And I, I feel like it's something everyone should get a chance to do that care for children with, um, with uh, chronic and, and and ongoing medical needs. Um, it just is such a, a powerful thing to see a child. I, I think, I can't remember Ann or Barry, if it was you. We see them in crisis moments, right? In the hospital only. We don't get that. Uh, most physicians don't get that experience of, of going into the home and seeing how wonderful um, things are there. Um, it's just a very, very powerful thing, a very eye opening thing. I remember my first home visit very clearly. Yeah, I can relate to this. Good. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I was going to say now that COVID, I think one of the highlights of COVID, if there's any, was Zoom. Um, and so I know that our trainees don't always get to be in the home physically, that there's nothing that really replaces that. But I have found that doing Zoom visits is sort of getting a peek into that home life. Um, and hopefully people are experiencing that as well. I, I Dr. Bar Markowitz, feel free to comment too, but I was also curious kind of along the lines of what Tressie was saying is that, you know, you, you practice and over years and years, you have these experiences and you learn these things and we share them in the book, but how can we do a better job of um, being, being real with our residents and sort of, and, and, and imparting this information during residency and during training so that we have sort of more empathetic physicians? I don't know if you have thoughts about that, Dr. Markovich. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. I think modeling the behavior and, um, you know, don't send the resident off to do the H and P. Go in and do it. you you know, do it with them. I, I know it takes time. Time is four letter word in in medicine, but um, uh, don't have to do it every day for every patient. But try to remember. You know, we don't forget about teaching. Going to a whiteboard and drawing out the Krebs cycle. Why Why can't we take that same amount of time and go into a patient's room and demonstrate how to communicate? Sit down. Don't stand over the patient you know, uh, uh, ask questions. And the other thing that we have today in today's times that we didn't have before are smartphones. Every parent has pictures or videos of their child at home at their best, ask to see those. So in short of doing home visits, you can, it can take, literally takes 30 seconds. Show me a picture of Sally when she's at her best at home. And it makes a huge difference. It can make a huge difference. I would say that Home visits were not, you know, my, in fact, outpatients weren't my thing. I, I tried opening up an outpatient ICU. People come in and get dopamine for four hours and go home, but it never really took off. So, <laughs> I had a question for Anne and, and also for Dr. Marcos. Uh, one of the differences between the way we round uh, today and the way we used to round perhaps when Jack was a child is we're, we're putting much more of an emphasis on making them family center rounds or you know, there's different mnemonics, I pass rounds and all. Um, and can you comment on how rounds, your memory of rounds were when Jack was small and what, uh, you know, if you could be the spokesperson for all the parents with children with uh, special health care needs, uh, from a parent's point of view, what do you like as far as different rounding styles? You know, meaning the, the two extremes, meaning one is you have lots of different doctors coming in by themselves. Uh, and the other one being you have a group of a team of doctors coming in at the same time with the nurse and uh, trying to do things all, uh, you know, include the parents in the presentation. Well, in 1999, 
we got kicked out of the ICU about 15 minutes before eight every morning when they did rounds. So we were not part of them at all. Um, and then we got kicked out again at shift change at night. Um, so yeah, we, other than one-on-one -on -one with the doctor, we were not part of rounds. I'm just talking ICU because that's where Jack was. I don't really know what it was like on the floor. Um, and then when Jack was in the hospital at Phoenix Children's, which would have been 2012, 2013, they had the team rounds and the parents were a part of it. But we'd come outside and we'd be outside the room. I don't remember being part of anybody coming in inside. It was always outside. And quite frankly, it's rather intimidating. I don't think, even, I mean, I'm not, well, I am, I, I didn't feel like I could say anything. I mean, it was good to listen, but I wasn't about to in front of all these people probably, you know, offer much. I think it's important that we're there to listen, but then ultimately it's probably better if one or two comes back and say, and talks to us on a, where we feel comfortable talking. Okay. In the words now, we are trying to have a model where the parents actually are asked to speak first. Just to briefly, you know, give an update to the team as far as how is your child doing compared to yesterday? Yeah, if, if, if uh, someone as um, uh, strong a personality as Anne could feel intimidated, imagine how a normal parent would feel. <laughs> I think that's a common theme from families was that I talk to is the big rounds are, are challenging. I think it's nicer if we do let the family tell us their needs and, and their thoughts first. Um, and I think it doesn't replace that one-on-one -on -one sit down, you know, communication in the room. Um, so... Um, I, I, yeah, it's a lot of people. Um, I see a comment or a question about considering creating a video that's mandatory in hospital orientation for physicians and other staff on this topic. Um, and I, um, I was just going to make a plug for the Courageous Parents Network, um, which I don't know if uh, folks are familiar with that. It's a wonderful resource um, by parents for parents, um, but I think it also um, by parents, for parents, and for providers as well. It's a very, very, I find it to be very helpful. It shares a lot of stories and a lot of different perspectives. Um, Blythe Lord um, and, and her um, foundation had created that. I don't know if, if Anne, if you have comments on the usefulness of that or Dr. Marker. Well, I just know they have an entire video library. I mean, I discovered Courageous Pet Parents Network after Jack died, so I didn't have the advantage of it, but I've spent time now looking at its website and it is very comprehensive. So you can, and, it, and there's, it's obviously, it's intended for providers as well as parents, a lot of topics. Yeah, in today's times, it's hard to get people to sit down and read a book. Um, we're in discussions about an audio book version We've also, it's been suggested as somebody did in the, in the Q&A that um, we were thinking about doing a documentary and following a family, you know, a day, day in the life of, you know, one of these uh, children and their families um, might be very powerful. And Dr. Markowitz, to give you a chance to ask, answer the previous question, how are you rounding out at Jonas Hospital Los Angeles, both in the ICUs and if you know, on the hospital wards? So we have um, been doing rounds. Um, I can speak more, uh, you know, authentically about what happens in the ICUs. Is they, they've been "quote unquote" family-centered rounds for a while, but I think we use that term uh, perhaps uh, to pat ourselves on the back more than that's actually true. The family's invited, um, but they don't have a they don't have a space. So the nurse presents the patient what's happened overnight, what's going on, medications, etc., and then the trainees will you know, discuss the plan for the day. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll say to the parent, you have any questions? You know, um, some parents will obviously will speak up. Others, you know, we, we do go back and talk to them later, of course. But so um, I love the idea of having the parents start. Like, what are your concerns today? You know, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, we've been doing that here for a few years now. But, uh, you know, ha having a long experience doing hospital medicine, I can't tell you how much I really like it, other than the first thing I hear is what the med student or the intern has to say. The very first question is, how do, how do you think uh, little Johnny is doing compared to yesterday? And, uh, you know, the, whatever the parent says, I'm all ears. And uh, frequently, uh, they really, you know, I mean, I find it, it's an efficiency booster, too, because you need me immediately know, uh, you know, sometimes I'll say, hey, he's better and he's ready to go home. 
And uh, and then that uh, you know, can hurt, you know very much shorten the need for the presentation. Or you know he's still having fevers, and you know this thing has been going on for two weeks, and I, I feel like we're getting nowhere. And again, you immediately know what the conversation needs to be. Um, so, and it doesn't take much time just asking the parents, you know, how is he doing compared to yesterday? So uh, I'm, I'm definitely sold on that. And I think we're, uh, you know, it's something our hospitals group is promoting here. Uh, but I was curious uh, how many other places were doing that on the ward. So uh, at this point, we're, we're up to our time. I don't see anything new in the chat or the Q&A. So I, I very much wanted to say thank you to both of you for taking on such a challenging topic and putting this together in a book um, that uh, you know everybody can benefit from and being willing to bring it to Grand Rounds, uh, which as you uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's a lot easier to uh, watch at Grand Rounds than it is to uh, pick up one of the millions of books on the market and uh, and read them all. And thanks to uh, Wendy and Tracy for joining us. Uh, and for having uh, the care you, you've given to uh, our patients uh, with special needs for so many years. Uh, and uh, everyone stay tuned for next week's uh, surgery grand rounds. It's going to be Dr. Molitor and congenital diaphragmatic hernias. And all of those uh, parents are going to be just like Anne uh, or have a life ahead of them uh, with a lot of medical complexity.